Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world, said Albert Einstein. Today we will talk not only about things that we imagine, about the world we imagine, about the vision. We will also talk about the steps that are necessary to be done to achieve the vision, to create the world we imagined. There are two crucial questions we need to answer. What has to be done and who has to do it? Czech ECOSOC presidency faces both these questions. The topic is towards sustainable, resilient and inclusive societies through participation of all. So where are we standing right now? What has been done and what should have been done and how can we, all of us, the whole society, help to create the world of the vision, the imagined world in which the 2030 agenda is truly fully fulfilled? These are just some of the topics we will discuss in the first panel. Thank you very much for joining us here in the Chernin Palace and also thank you very much for joining us live thanks to the live stream that is available on the Facebook page of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic as well as of the Institute of International Relationships. The official hashtag of the conference is ECOSOC Prague and we will be very happy if you will join us in the debate not only with your questions but also with the vote. On the table you can find a sheet of paper it's uh, blue and white and you can use it to vote to tell us what do you truly think about participation. And I will use these results because I will have your answers by 10 a.m. So there is still 20 minutes left for you to vote. And I will use your opinions and challenge distinguished guests who will be sitting here on the stage. And I will ask about their opinions, about things that you truly believe and you truly think. So please join us in the vote. And now, Let's welcome our distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, President of the 72nd session of the United Nations General Assembly, His Excellency Miroslav Lajčák. Thank you very much. Please take a seat. Please welcome Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Her Excellency Amina Mohamed. Good morning to you and thank you very much for joining us and also the ECOSOC President, Her Excellency Maria Shatarova. Thank you very much. Mr. President, would the world be different without the 2030 Agenda? Absolutely. But How? Not, not in a good way. But let me start by thanking the Foreign Minister of the Czech Republic for hosting us this morning, for congratulating on the successful ECOSOC presidency. I'm very pleased to be back in Chernin, where I started my diplomatic career almost 30 years ago. And I'm very pleased that we are discussing the Sustainable Development Goals, which is truly a global agenda. Uh, we need to speak about SDGs. And uh, this is a complex question, but the world would be different without SDGs. And as I said, not in a good way, because in the first place, the world without 2030 agenda would be the world which is unable to meet the growing needs of our growing population. We are going to have 8.6 billion people living on this planet by 2030, 9.8 by 2050. And that means people need food, water, housing, and uh, I mean, satisfaction of their basic needs. We won't be able to do that without 2030 Agenda. Second, without the 2030 Agenda, without the SDGs, we will not be able to address a number of systemic problems on this planet, such as urbanization, unsustainable agricultural practice, weak governance, climate change, and many others. The world without 2030 Agenda would be the world where large parts of the world's population will be facing inequality, in injustice, they will lack access to basic education, to decent jobs. They will have no access to water and sanitation, uh, to the basic health care. The world without 2030 agenda would be the world where unilateral agendas will dominate over our common responsibility. And the world without 2030 agenda would be also the world where multilateralism will be damaged and weakened and uh, will be dominant by individual agendas of individual countries. 
So therefore, for me, the adoption of Sustainable Development Goals Agenda uh, represents the acknowledgement of the fact that we are increasingly facing global challenges that we cannot answer in our individual capacities. That's extremely important. What's also important is that uh, even though they are not binding in the nature, the member states have accepted them, have translated them into the national reg legislation, into the national strategies. And it's very positive that in two years since their adoption, we had 70, 65 sorry, member states have already presented their national strategies to the UN General Assembly. This year, another 47 will do so. So we will have 112 countries already presenting. When I was presiding over the general debate last September, I was, it was remarkable to note that sustainable development agenda, together with climate change, was the most frequently mentioned topic in the speeches and statements of the heads of states and governments. More than 167 uh, leaders referred to the SDGs, which shows that there is a general acknowledgement of the crucial importance of this agenda. Yet, uh, the work is not done yet. So we, we still have many challenges to address. We, the progress has been clearly here, but uh, it's rather uneven. And one of the big issues that we need to solve right now is to bridge the gap between our agenda, between our goals, and the financial resources that are needed to fund them. Because right now, we are not set on the path to meet the 2030 agenda by 2030. So we are short of five to seven trillion US dollars annually to meet these goals. But the good news is that money is there. The institutional money, private money. So what we are working on in the United Nations right now is to bring, to connect this money with the, with the Sustainable Development Goals agenda. And with this purpose, I'll be organizing a high-level event in June, June 11th, focusing exactly on these issues. So we can be proud of uh, uh, demonstrating our global responsibility by adopting the Sustainable Development Goals agenda, but it would be too soon to call the mission accomplished. We, there is a lot of work for us to do. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for the answer. Your Excellency, the very same question. From your personal opinion, from your perspective, would the world be different without the 2030 agenda? Thank you very much, and I want to join my uh, voice in, in uh, appreciation of this invitation to come here and, and to have this discussion at such an important point in the time of the UN when ECOSOC is contemplating um, how we reform to be fit for purpose to actually carry out um, the agenda itself. I think in simple terms, the world would be in a state of disintegration if we did not have the 2030 agenda. I think it is as serious as that. We were fortunate that in 2012, it was member states that recognized in Rio that we had to do something about that and had the foresight to put in place a inclusive process that would bring everyone um, into, the, the, uh, into the space to shape the new agenda. Um, and I'm so pleased that we have the minister from Colombia here with us because they really were the mothers, as, they, as we say, of um, caretakering the, the SDGs, um, the whole sustainable development agenda. Um, that foresight brought in the fact that the first thing we hadn't done with the Millennium Development Goals was finish them. They were unfinished business. Um, but they recognized it was a framework that really did work in bringing the world together to address some very critical issues. And without that, we would not have seen um, the reduction of poverty. We would not have seen the reduction of maternal mortality or child mortality. We really would not have seen um, a world coming together around these issues in the way in which it had done. So I think it, it set us um, a good start. Um, having said that, we went through four years of really um, testing um, our world to see if we had it in us to put together an ambitious agenda that would be responsive to some of the major challenges that you heard the Prime Minister and the Foreign Affairs Minister and our Minister from Colombia uh, say. We are not in a good place. Um, although we may have sovereignty and borders around us, many of the issues that we face then and today even more so um, are uh, global in nature. They don't have borders. Climate change does not recognize borders. Uh, the issues we have with terrorism do not recognize that. Uh, the, the issues of migration and refugees and the humanitarian crisis we have don't recognize borders. So we need a collective response um, for that responsibility in, in our world today. We need to achieve those five Ps, which are very far, far from being, being done. Um, we did go through 
um, and I'm, I'm just sitting directly opposite one of those that caretakered the whole four-year process, Ambassador Kamau from Kenya, um, together with the, our, our Irish PR. It, it was an important um, process that brought in everybody's voice, which is why it's so important today. Um, as the President of the General Assembly said, this is not a legally binding agreement, but everyone has a stake in it, uh, that you have the unfinished MDGs in the first six goals, that we're really talking about inclusive economies and inequalities from 7 to 15, recognizing that climate is a big issue and so is the environment, and that all cannot stand without us looking at the rule of law, institutions, and the partnerships that we need. So I think what we got at the end of the day was what is a response to what is much needed. Um, and, and while we see the challenges, we must see the opportunities. Uh, the opportunities for me, the biggest is that I hope, and I don't see too many in the room, is our youth. This is the largest cohort that we have. It is on their watch that they have the opportunity to really bend the curve on climate change, uh, to do something that is sustainable uh, going through the future. We're two years into the SDGs, that I think of, is, is of note. Um, and that we have to do so much more in terms of engaging in it. The SDGs are not just 17 goals. It really is about the, the way in which our economies interact with our people and that they're at the center of it and that we don't add on human rights, that it is a major part of what we do. Um, and, and I think that this is, uh, it's very exciting. The opportunities outweigh the challenges if we can come together. And I think this is where the United Nations multilateralism, um, that global village we have, um, must be one in which we take that collective responsibility to make it work. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, your perspective. Thank you very much. Um, the disadvantage uh, of talking last in a panel, uh, <laughs> especially <laughs> after so skilled uh, speakers is that uh, everything crucial was already said. Uh, I will try to uh, put it uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, of course, the web development would not stop without the 2030 Agenda. However, uh, the 2030 Agenda is a great motivation for all member states. I would uh, compare it to, to a player who trains every day to be better. But uh, in the end, he was uh, to be at his best during the Olympics. And players are member states, and the Olympics is the 2030 agenda. It is this uh, dream event uh, to which um, everyone wishes to go. It is this uh, great uh, motivation for member states. And from my position as uh, the president of the ECOSOC, uh, I can confirm that uh, the states are determined. A uh, high-level political forum is uh, organized uh, every year under the auspices of the ECOSOC, uh, and uh, many, many participants from all around the world uh, are there, not only member states, but uh, different stakeholders. A part of uh, this high-level political forum are voluntary national reviews, as the President of the General uh, Assembly uh, mentioned. Sixty-five member states presented their voluntary national reviews so far, and 47 will do so this year. And as um, uh, the, this name said, voluntary national reviews are voluntary. Uh, the, the interest is even higher, but uh, we have a technical logistic problem to fit uh, all interested countries into three ministerial days. It is uh, definitely something we must uh, think uh, about uh, because we must uh, give the opportunity to member states to present their voluntary national reviews. And we uh, have uh, already a big number of uh, applicants for next year. And what uh, pleases me as uh, the president of the ECOSOC is that uh, more and uh, more countries uh, involve uh, different stakeholders to their uh, voluntary national reviews. Uh, the Czech Republic uh, presented um, its voluntary national review last year, and we have in our delegation our Minister of Environment, uh, 
the representative of uh, civil society and youth and a representative of private sector. Uh, I um, had a honor, a chance to moderate it, and I can confirm that it was successful. But many, many other countries uh, had a really very, very successful presentation. Uh, the ECOSOC um, organizes a, a high number of different uh, important forums uh, involving uh, different uh, stakeholders too. We will have partnership forum and we had end of uh, January uh, quite good uh, use forum. Deputy Secretary General uh, engaged uh, in, a, in an interactive dialogue with, uh, with young people. It was for the first time. Uh, we did it. Uh, she's, she, she's really amazing because she's, uh, she's everywhere and uh, she, she really speaks uh, very well. And for young people it was a good motivation. For the first time we had also uh, virtual participation during this youth forum uh, to enable young people who could not attend uh, this uh, meeting in New York uh, uh, to participate and uh, the, the interest was, uh, was amazing. But what is the most important uh, on these kind of forums is that, um, for example, Youth Forum wasn't an uh, isolated meeting only. Uh, we uh, really uh, wanted to build uh, a powerful, active network uh, uh, which could grow and it's growing and, uh, and constantly growing. Uh, I had a chance to speak uh, with uh, many ministers from different countries uh, about their internal mechanisms uh, uh, for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. I uh, could uh, see the work of the regional commissions rec recently in Bangkok uh, and in Geneva. Uh, they, they really they are doing uh, also a great, uh, great job and all of that uh, brings me to the conclusion that uh, this uh, immense mobilization would not exist without the 2030 agenda. I like your sport analogy. If, if the state is a sportman, let's say, for example a skier, who is the coach and who are the fans? State is the player, where is general public? General public is the coach or politicians are the coach? Who is? the group that is supporting and pushing the sportman forward? I think that it is uh, both, both ways process that uh, the governments uh, must uh, give guidelines but uh, the citizens must participate and government uh, uh, have to give uh, the opportunity to the citizens to be involved. Uh, citizens must have the will and uh, uh, trust towards governments that uh, they can participate and that it is important that they participate. And that they can change actually something, yeah. that they can cause a change. Your Excellency, you have mentioned that without the 2030 agenda uh, the situation would be called as a state of disintegration. Which areas do you find to be at risk right now? Which are the most problematic ones? In which areas are we behind the schedule with fulfilling the 2030 agenda? Um, I, I think first that um, as a collective um, in the world today, this universal agenda is at risk in terms of the way we are becoming much more insular about solving the problems and using the opportunities. So I would say that um, one of the greater challenges is multilateralism, is the fact that we can go further together and do better together, and yet we are not doing that. Um, the signals are not good, and I think that that's why we're so pleased that we're here today because I think the UN has to come out of New York um, and it has to come to the people and we have to communicate better and we have to explain why it is so important that this uh, town hall that we have uh, for the global village is so important um, and we have to explain this to, to uh, citizens, to young people, in fact to governments as well. Um, when you asked about you know, who's the coach, frankly um, every person's aspiration is what we should be delivering. This is not a question of us um, doing charity to people. It's their right to aspire to the, the very basics that the, the SDGs provide for. Um, and, and again, I think that you know, that challenge is about us all coming together. 
uh, it, it's necessary because it is together that we will shift some of the very difficult challenges that we have. Uh, for instance, how do you unlock the resources that we do have um, to implement this agenda? How do we take away um, what we say, what I would say are excuses um, as to why we cannot invest, uh, business cannot be a part um, of the solution um, at scale? Um, and, and, uh, and, and much of this, I think, is, is requ it requires the collective to do that. And so I would hope that, that that's what we do going forward. That young people participate not because it's about their future. Their future is today. We have young people who, in many countries, today are a cause of instability because they have no hope, because there are no alternatives. And we have to turn that around. And we can only do that together where everyone is responding um, to looking for the solutions. I would like to talk about the younger generation in detail in a separate part of the debate. Now, Mr. President, I would like to ask you for your perspective, how to unlock these resources? Because you have mentioned we are lacking five to seven trillion US dollars. How to unlock this money? What we need are two factors that were not mentioned yet. The, f the first one is called inclusivity and the second one, partnerships. Mm -hmm. Inclusivity means that uh, even though it's clear that it's the governments who, who carry the bulk of responsibility for implementation of sustainable development goals, they cannot do it alone. So they need other segments of the society. They need civil society, they need business sector, they need financial institutions, they need academia, they and, and the whole of society means women and young people, as the Deputy Secretary General just said. Uh, if it's only the governmental agenda, we will, not, we will not succeed. And partnerships means that it's uh, the member states, it's the UN family as such, it's the international institutions. Uh, so that means it is a truly universal agenda and uh, we have to make sure that everybody understands the importance and everybody can contribute. And right now, as I said, uh, well, I'm organizing four high-level events as a president of the UN General Assembly. Three of them are dedicated to the Sustainable Development Goals agenda. So four days ago, we had the first one on water. We launched the International Decade of Water, uh, Water for Sustainable Development. This year is very much about water, and obviously there is no peace without water, there is no development without water, there is no human dignity without water. Uh, water means a lot for, for energy, so this is what uh, we spend uh, the event uh, discussing about. My next high-level event will be about young people, 30th of May, inviting youth and speaking about uh, the quality education and access to education, prospect for decent jobs and for employment and prevention from radicalization, mm -hmm. which all goes hand in hand. And then, as I said, the, the last one will be on financing for development. So, the good thing is that we do have the agenda. The good thing is that we have a commitment from so many member states. The bad thing is that the progress has been uneven, that not in every member state there has been the progress. And as I said, we really have to bring the finances which are there. We speak about like 7% of the global GDP that is needed for the implementation. But we need to link this, this money to this. So therefore, we have no time to waste. We have to stay the course. We have to stay focused on, on the implementing. Uh, we still have time to do so. Are we on the right track right now? As I said, uh, in general, yes. Mm -hmm. And it's astonishing to see to some, uh, how many uh, governments are committed. Uh, how many governments... I was in Colombia 10 days ago. I was in, in Addis uh, three weeks ago. And the governments are reporting about how, 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 much, uh, how they identify themselves with the SDGs. How, how, to what extent the SDGs have become their national strategies. But at the same time, there are countries where SDGs have not yet landed, say, uh, or there are countries that are committed, but they lack the resources. So that means, in general, yes, we are on the right track, uh, but we have to look into the particularities, where we are lagging behind, what's the problem, what's the reason, and how to address the problem. Her Excellency Amina Mohamed said during today's morning press conference that uh, ECOSOC is mothership for development. How would you describe the role of ECOSOC in the 2030 agenda? Uh, ECOSOC is uh, at the heart of the United uh, Nations uh, system to advance uh, three dimensions of uh, sustainable development, economic, social and environment. Important to realize all these uh, three uh, dimensions. And as um, 
I um, already uh, said uh, uh, ECOSOC is this central platform for uh, member states uh, to uh, share their uh, achievements uh, in uh, aligning their national policies with the 2030 agenda. It is um, also a platform uh, for them to share their, uh, their failures or their, their, their problems because it is about uh, the open discussion. Uh, ECOSOC uh, links uh, uh, diverse, uh, a diverse uh, family of uh, different uh, uh, UN entities uh, uh, linked to the sustainable development. Uh, it is uh, about the coordination of uh, uh, agencies, funds, uh, programs, uh, uh, and uh, committees, commissions. Uh, it's really a big family. Uh, and through this uh, coordination role of the ECOSOC, uh, it seems that ECOSOC is uh, uh, indirectly uh, responsible for around 70% uh, both uh, human and financial resources uh, of the United Nations. And ECOSOC uh, uh, organizes uh, uh, this uh, important forums as youth forum we will have in april partnership forum we will have forum on financing of development we have development cooperation forum we will have multi-stakeholder forum on science technology and innovation high level political forum and uh, many others and, uh, each of these forums has up to 1000 delegates everything is broadcasted and uh, we are uh, trying to build this network I, I already mentioned. You are mentioning how to talk about the Agenda 2030, how to explain the Agenda 2030, the benefits, the investments that are closely connected to Agenda 2030. Your Excellency, you have mentioned the young generation and the necessity to talk to young generation. What's the response of the youth when you talk to them about Agenda of the year 2030 or the 2030 Agenda? We've had an amazing response from young people um, right from when we started to shape the goals. They were really involved um, and they pushed and they communicated. And I think a lot of what you see today and the momentum that is still going is because of young people and business. Um, and I think it's important just here to talk about when we say young people, let's, let's understand we mean both men and women because often we talk about youth and it's almost as though you're talking about just the boys. It isn't. It's very much about the girls as well. So I think they were engaged um, in the beginning. The, the operationalizing, implementing the SDGs is difficult um, to comprehend. What is my role in that? And how can I make a difference? How can I contribute to that? And I think this is where we have to learn better to communicate um, where they would participate, uh, not in, in New York or even you know, um, in, in, in Geneva where we all are, um, with the Human Rights Council and other specialized agencies, but really in the country level. How do we bring them in um, to, uh, into shaping what the priorities are of a country? Um, government is there, but it, is, it needs to be informed by people. It needs to be informed by their aspirations. So I think young people will probably better communicate this for us. I would urge that they do more um, in terms of... Uh, when you see the agenda itself, those 17 goals are very well articulated. So are the targets. So are the indicators. There is, as I say, no rocket science about it. So they need to engage. They need to apply it to the situations that they find themselves in, look at the partnerships that are needed to action um, many of those goals coming together. As I said, a lot of it is centered around the economy. Individually, they can do things. In their workplace, they can. But they can also put pressure on government uh, to make the right investments. Um, we, we spoke right now about the amount of uh, resources that are required. It, it is beyond... The, the public purse to do this. So you do need the private sector. You need to unlock um, private investments to come into it and find innovative ways of doing it. Um, and I think that that's a challenge too. Mm -hmm. There are many re regulations around. We, um, the PGA had an interesting lunch the other day where he invited key stakeholders. So while I look at Mahmoud and uh, who, who sort of instigated let we need billions to go to trillions, um, that community said to us, look, there are a number of barriers that need to be taken down institutionally. Mm -hmm. Regulations are good to try to protect us, to make sure we don't have another financial crisis, but risk has to be shared. And so how do we do that to open that up? And I think that, you know, there are many young people who today are engaged in entrepreneurship. They are engaged in the business um, and need to be um, activated to do what they can and, and, and play their part. 
quoting your words, young people communicate better than we ever did. How to use it to have a chance to promote the 2030 agenda in a better way, in a more understandable way? Because I will add uh, one more sentence that you said this very morning. Language of United Nations was always difficult. Yes, it's, it, it's, you know, when we talk about the six official languages as a seventh, it's core UNEs. <laughs> um, we're full of acronyms and, and, you know, even ECOSOC, when you have to start to break down what is ECOSOC, is difficult outside the United Nations. And I think that um, it's for, for one of the most interesting sessions I've had is to sit with young people and say, well, this is what we're about. Could you communicate it? Because we can't. There's just no way that we would do that. And, and they do. Uh, they do it on social media. Um, I mean, what is very interesting to me is that I will take about three minutes to explain a question that you will ask me, and they'll say it in a tweet. So I've been trying to figure out in my head, how do I answer your question in tweets? Or somebody will say the elevator pitch, the time it takes um, to go uh, from one floor to another. Um, I, they have the language that spreads across borders because the internet is there, um, because they are far more um, able to, to link that with their aspirations than ours. I mean, we have to know that they have the energy. Uh, they're thinking about the future way beyond 2030. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us to open up that space for them. And that's why it was so interesting for us to have more young people um, in the UN uh, trying to do things. We, we still have a long way to go, um, but it's about us getting out there, um, engaging them at the country level. I think the most important thing is we're talking about implementation now. Um, how do we get governments to incentivize and open up that space um, to provide um, the, the, uh, the, the wherewithal for them to engage financially, education, um, making sure that they've got equal rights uh, uh, to, to participate. It can be also the pressure of the young generation that could help to persuade governments to participate. Well, absolutely. I mean, you, you saw over the weekend uh, young people's voices in, in the United States stretched across borders around the world. They stood up to say, we need a safer environment in our schools, and they were addressing the gun laws. I think that that, you know, is, is quite amazing. It's young people doing that, and you can see the ripple effect of it happening. I think more needs to happen um, along those lines. I'm, I'm, I'm always... Uh, as a former activist, uh, will say get out on the streets and um, have that peaceful demonstration, but let your voice be heard. Um, and I think the collective voice is important, and young people don't have the same barriers that are in our minds today, um, uh, and I think that that's helpful for the future. It's where you, you see um, the light at the end of that tunnel uh, 13 years to go. And do you see this kind of movement the voice of young generation, as you have mentioned, we saw yesterday in the United States of America, as a thing that should be common for the whole world. Also for Europe, for, for example, Czech Republic, that we should support young people to sometimes go in the streets and say, okay, we want this, we think this, we are truly persuaded, we need this change. I think first, before you get to the street, it's got to be pretty dire. I mean, if you can't convince people in rooms like this and in the opportunities parliaments are supposed to give, remember, we're talking about democracy. So how many parliaments are actually open to their citizens mm -hmm. to inform those agendas and carry out those aspirations? Uh, by the time you get to the street, it's pretty serious. And, and then you do have to take notice. So I hope that we will take notice before then. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, then I think, you know, young people's voices should be heard uh, in whichever corridor or street you can find them. It, it's important. I mean, we, we cannot afford not to implement the 2030 agenda. This is a really sensible and uh, a doable agenda. I think that's what makes it exciting, is that you can actually do it. We have the wherewithal to accomplish the goals um, that we set out. Again, I'm fortunate because I've got six children in my home, so if I didn't do it, the youth would be using me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, what do you think about these kind of movements of young people who are voicing their worries and their opinions out loud? First of all, I think it's a mistake to refer to young people as them, because they are us. So it's not us and young people. Young people are part of everything we do, and they have to feel being part of everything we do. The, I also disagree with when we say that they are the force of the future, because they are again, the force of today, of the present. So uh, we have to, to change the narrative in the first mm -hmm. place. And second, I would again say three key words. Communication, and uh, I mean, I already referred to this. We have a tendency in the international systems to lock ourselves into a special language that only we understand and people outside of the system 
do not. Uh, we, we, therefore, the communication is key. We must be able to get our message across in a plain language so that people understand. Because if they don't understand what we do, it, it's difficult to expect that they will support what we do. So uh, second, uh, feedback. Again, we need the reality check. We need to go out. We need to meet with people in the member states uh, to, to hear from them how much they know about what the United Nations does, how much they care, how much they identify themselves with our work. So wherever I go, I do meet with young people, uh, and it's very inspiring. Uh, and uh, this brings me to my third point, which is collecting the dots. Because you, you meet so many young people with uh, excellent projects that, is, that are affecting the lives of, of, of their surroundings, of their environment. A couple of hundreds, a couple of thousands of people. Uh, that, that has a huge potential to inspire the others, but the others don't know about it. And that's why we are, the, the way we are trying to organize the, the, our meeting on youth in, in uh, uh, May is that I'm inviting young people wherever I go to, to help me shape the agenda. We have established an interactive web, web page and I'm asking young people to contribute, to, to engage, make sure that, to engage, to make sure that we uh, speak about the issues that are important to them. Mm -hmm. And I also want to have, of course, as many young people as possible in the room because this is, it's not for us to speak about them. It's not even about for us to speak to them. It's really for us to speak with them and to, to hear what they have to say to us. So this is, uh, I think, the, the approach that we have to, to, uh, well, to support. In December 2017, you mentioned that uh, 17 global goals should be part of the curriculum, should be part of what uh, children are taught at school. What level do you find crucial? When and how should we teach children about the 2030 agenda? I think this is a crucial point because um, if you are raised and educated knowing and promoting the sustainable agenda, that means you are raised as a responsible global citizen. Global citizen is not opposite to being a proud uh, citizen of your country and patriot, but global citizen means uh, that you are aware of wider aspects of everything and of uh, global responsibility. Because as I said in my introductory remarks, we are increasingly facing changes that are, or challenges that are global in their nature. No country can deal with climate change on its own. No country can deal with, uh, with, uh, with migration on its own. No country can deal with many other issues. So that means we have to be aware of our joint responsibility and shared responsibility for, for our planet. And this will not you know, happen out of nowhere. Yep. And therefore, you have to be educated. And SDGs are the best curriculum for that because then you see yourself as part of, of, of a global entity, of global world. So therefore, I, I, I would really suggest that all the member states uh, incorporate the SDGs into their curricula in elementary schools. And I think it would help uh, to change the, the mindset of, of billions of people. I do believe you would agree. You would agree. Both yeah, of you. I, yeah. I, I would really agree because uh, uh, young people, but uh, all people uh, have to understand that uh, the sustainable development goals and 2030 agenda is about the everyday life, that it is not uh, a plan of uh, world leaders, uh, but that it is about uh, make uh, a world better, but uh, with the impact on everyday life of everybody. And we have uh, around 1.6 billion youth uh, at the age uh, from 15 to 24 years. Uh, it means that the 2030 agenda really concerns them and to, to introduce uh, this uh, uh, education about the 2030 agenda to, to, to the school curriculums is a really a very good uh, idea and not only very good idea but it is a necessity in my view. Uh, thanks to the organization D21, I learned about the research that says that uh, at the age of nine, young children are able to participate in the participation, in the process of taking part in what's happening in the civil society. Do you have the same experience? These young people can truly understand that if they want something, they can work for it, they can do it, they can make the change? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, a child has to have a conducive environment to understand what are those social responsibilities and, and sense of community. And I think when you are bringing up a child, 
these are an important part of it. I'm not sure that you want them to, by rote, say what the 17 goals are, but understand exactly what they mean for them um, as they go. But I, I'm also a strong believer in allowing a child to have a childhood. Um, I think that often we are, uh, you know, children are growing up too quickly, and, and that in, it, in itself is a heavy burden and responsibility. And if we really start to think about the stress in adolescence um, and in young people, um, we probably put too much on them much earlier. So that collective responsibility of community, of family, of society to, to bring um, everyone along with the SDGs is important. But, you know, we're talking about education for those who have it. I think we have to have a wake-up call that there are hundreds of millions that don't have education. Um, and how do you bring them into uh, the socialization of the SDGs and their rights to education even within that? So on the one hand, less, let those who, you know, catch them young, that's fine. For those who've missed an education, we need to catch them too. Um, for those who've had an education and it is not an education, we have to catch them as well. So there are different levels that you have to come into in a universal agenda. It is not a cookie cutter. Yeah. And I think that this is where the hard work is, that, um, especially in governments. We haven't socialized the SDGs in governments. We are busy um, looking at the reform in the United Nations on how we will help to support countries to implement it. We're not there yet. Uh, we have um, United Nations information, information centers. They will have to find a different way of communicating what is um, a much wider, broader, deeper agenda um, than the MDGs ever were. And education, that's also a thing that you mentioned during your vote. Thank you very much for joining us in the vote. I've uh, received the results of, of the vote uh, from the organization D21. The very first question was, which areas do you personally consider suitable for participation projects? And uh, second and third place, it's shared, belongs to education and urban development. First place is municipal governance. What do you think about the result? Municipal, Municipal governance. governance. The very first place, second place, urban development, third, education, four, community organi organizing, and uh, five, budgeting. Interesting. But not surprising in a way, because every global goal is implemented locally. So uh, it's really about our ability to, to create a chain mm -hmm. that uh, starts, let's say, at the global level with the United Nations, but that, that is understood and, and, and embraced on the, on the local level. From global to local. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you have to be identified with the, glo the global goals, which again brings me back to my point of communication and the feedback. That's really important. But when uh, everything you do, you do in your working place, you, you, you do in your village or in your <coughs> town, in your city, that means you do it locally. And therefore, it's, uh, it's really interesting that, uh, uh, to see that the, the municipal level was chosen as the most important element. Yes, actually it actually uh, is. Yeah, I, I am not surprised because uh, uh, we organized uh, four working breakfasts in New York within our presidency priority and one of them was with local government. And a representative a panelist from uh, the OECD mentioned that according to the OECD survey, 65% of uh, targets within the 2030 agenda couldn't be accomplished uh, without the, the participation and involvement of local government. Mm -hmm. I think that it is uh, really important because uh, local government, it is uh, about uh, everyday life uh, well, on, the, on, on the ground. Mm -hmm. so not surprising for Something me. that can people truly identify with, yeah. you mean, on a daily basis. Yeah. The second question you answered was, towards sustainable, resilient and inclusive societies through participation of all is the main topic of this particular conference. And that's why we also asked, participation can help too, blank. Majority of you said, promote discussion among members of a community. Second place, facilitate a decision-making process. Third, promote inclusion. Would you agree? It's all the same, as a matter of fact. So, sorry, but... Uh, Dialogue is the key, mm -hmm. yes, and uh, with all the modern communication technologies, we have less dialogue now than we used to have years back. Somehow we have no time to listen to each other. We have time to convey our message, but somehow it looks like we run away from getting the, the message back. And, and therefore, obviously, uh, if we want to be successful, then we have to represent the, the opinions and views of majority, mm -hmm. and we can only get there uh, through dialogue and through our ability to listen to each other and to eventually adjust our initial views by reflecting the views and opinions of the others. 
thanks to the system of the vote, we have a chance to also see what you do not think. Because uh, you could use uh, up to three positive points, that yes, I agree, but also a negative point saying I disagree totally. And minus three, that's the final result of uh, conduct opinion research. Uh, the question was participate can help too, and uh, a lot of you think that it does not help to conduct opinion research. Participation is not saying what people truly believe in an opinion research. I think they're probably right. Um, I think a lot of the participation we've had to date has been, until we got the SDGs, I think, has been sterile consultations. Mm -hmm. We find ourselves in a room talking to the converted. Um, we also find ourselves not following on from that conversation that's been had. But I think what we've done with the SDGs is that we've challenged people in every, in every manner um, to how you can act on them. Uh, it's an action-oriented agenda. It is not siloed. It does not, um, you cannot take one or two goals and say that's it, you've, you've scored. So I think that when they say participation doesn't necessarily result in that change, um, I think in the past that's right. I think that's why we haven't got as far as we need to get to. We need to change the way we participate. We need to be speaking with each other. Um, I, I, the global to local needs to be local to global as well. I don't think it can be just one a one-way street. It has to come back um, and so that we can course correct and we can get a truly um, uh, uh, universal response to it. So I hope that in shaping the implementation and, and determining what the priorities are in people's local governments in their countries, that that participation will become much more genuine. Mm -hmm. There is a trust deficit. The recent surveys that were done to say that the, um, that the trust has gone down in government um, and uh, with um, media. Mm -hmm. This is really uh, an important indicator that when you see trust has gone up with the, with the United Nations and with civil society, then you know there's a gap in that participation in how we engage with one another and how we affect what we say inform the agenda. Mm -hmm. If you don't get the results that you expect, then you know, as they say, what goes in is what comes out. And, and I think that that's what we have to con concentrate. So participate means what? We need to define that better. The processes need to be more holistic. Uh, we need to check that did that participation yield results. And I, I think often we miss that result piece. Do not to skip a step. Did you vote? Did you have a chance to vote? No, we no. talked. No? no? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. So let's give you a chance to vote. There is the third question. What are the major obstacles to participation? I will give you five options, and I'm not saying that it's the very same order as the audience said. Low level of general public literacy or civic and political education. Second possibility, threat of populism and extremism, corruption, budgetary limitations, or social cultural norms. What are the major obstacles of participation? Well, in a way, all, all of it, yes. All, yeah. uh, Would you say all of them? Yeah, could, you, could you name two that you consider to be the most, I would say, problematic, the crucial? Okay, you're asking people who've got short-term memory loss here um, to remember <laughs> what you apologies. just said. My apologies, my deepest apologies. Um, but I think, I think if I remember the last one, in terms of community, uh, the cultural and social yes. norms, I think that's a really big barrier to participation for young people, especially women. I will add uh, the... Uh, and then I think, is there another one that has something to do with government? Oh, yes. Low level of general public's literacy or civic and political education, the threat of populism and extremism, uh, corruption, budgetary limitations, or social cultural norms. Yeah. yeah I mean, I'm all for the social cultural norms because I know that women suffer from, from that as, okay. as much and also young people. You know, we always talk about the glass ceiling for women and we've been trying to shatter that and I think doing not badly, especially on this stage that we finally got parity. <laughs> but um, young people have concrete ceilings, mm -hmm. and we have to crack those. So, and participation yeah. has to come through institutions and platforms that allow that. So maybe the, the piece on budgetary and, and corruption is also another barrier to participation. Mr. President? For me, number one would be the number one. That means the, the low level of... Uh, low level of general uh, public yeah. uh, literacy and yes. civic and social education. And then number Political, five. Sorry. And then number five, I agree with the DSG here, yeah. that uh, there's limitations that stem from culture and so yeah. Correct answer. Oh, uh, I think the first one, but uh, I would add to the first one uh, also uh, the, the political will. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, well, uh, we need political mm -hmm. will and we need to overcome the silos. But uh, I, uh, I see also many other points, uh, not only those uh, definitely, in, definitely. In, in, in your survey. Yeah. If, if I just picked just a few of those that were available for, yeah. for those who... Maybe uh, even what's yeah. available. I would disagree with number one. An illiterate person is not a stupid person. And they have an opinion. No, 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 but they and they can say they so. Just may not have the access to the information. They do that, have access to information yeah. because you, illiteracy is about reading and writing. And one of the greatest forms of communication for participation in the developing world is the radio. So it's not just about you being able to put pen to paper um, or to read. It is about those spaces that you open up to communicate with people so that their issues come forth and you carry them. It's why we say you have parliament and people representing you, civil society taking those issues to the parliament where people may be illiterate. How does civil society do that? They sit and they communicate, they write up those issues and they take them. So I think that that's not the greatest barrier that we have even though it was put there. Maybe it's assumed to be, it's a perception. Unfortunately, that perception is carrying a lot of weight. Um, to, to say that that's a participation because then you're waiting until they're educated before they can participate? I don't think so. But it is here <laughs> because this was the number one answer. Is this just this room? Yes, in this room. Okay, then we get it. <laughs> <laughs> you will have tough two days, I would say. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Welcome to Central Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, majority of you said that uh, the major obstacle uh, to participation is actually low level of general public literacy or civic and political education. Second place, threat of populism and extremism. Third, lack of expert knowledge to facilitate a successful process. Four and five, legal restrictions and corruption. And uh, the social cultural norms I've mentioned. Yeah, but it's the I, last. I think I, I don't like the, the word literacy. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's Perhaps the, 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 word, the word expression we, we don't like and the future secretary general uh, they don't like in, in this number one. Just uh, the it's term you mean? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, term, yeah. Interesting points, interesting perspectives. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we started the debate, she said to me, if I don't like your questions, I will use the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> For that reason, she, 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 she has, she has the microphone. I have the microphone. Have now you see, I have the microphone. Um, <laughs> I, I was thinking that you know there was not a you know not gender friendly medium for my voice because uh, and, and just with you, you're having to hold your microphone. Everything is perfect for the man. Stand up. Your microphone is properly put into your jacket, and so is yours. But there's nothing for my dress because you know they have <laughs> she's still having to carry her microphone. She had a jacket on; she'd be able to put it in. So that was my my thing was that I had to find the good in everything. So <laughs> the good in this is <laughs> I have it. <laughs> Let's jump back to uh, the participation. Uh, uh, Your Excellency Shatarva, if you consider the situation in the Czech Republic, because we are right now in the Czech Republic, in the Chernin Palace. What's the level of the participation in here, and what's the level that you are promoting as the president of ECOSO? Uh, yeah, the participation is at the core of uh, my presidency, because it is our presidency priority. We have been trying to promote the participation uh, by involving uh, maximum of stakeholders to these different forums I, uh, I spoke about, uh, and, uh, especially uh, youth uh, people, uh, but uh, also to put uh, the topic of participation uh, to uh, the work of uh, the main UN bodies uh, and uh, the meetings of uh, subsidiary commissions, subsidiary bodies, uh, and uh, I've been trying to, uh, to speak about the participation uh, in my speeches at different conferences. Uh, I, I am invited uh, recently, uh, for example, at uh, the Council, the OECD in, uh, in, in Paris. Uh, but what's the level of participation of the, of the Czech Republic? Uh, I am here as the president of, uh, of the ECOSOC uh, and not uh, as uh, the Czech ambassador and, or Czech politicians. I, I, I can't judge it, but uh, I think that uh, uh, people are interested uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, in the participation. Uh, sometimes uh, 
perhaps uh, really they, they, they lack inf the information. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the same in, in all countries. There are some uh, uh, necessary elements uh, to be introduced uh, in uh, well, legal and uh, regulatory frameworks. Uh, because uh, participation uh, can be improvised mm -hmm. in my way to be sustainable. It can be ad hoc uh, if it is about one mm -hmm. meeting, but uh, not uh, sustainable. Uh, there must be political will at the national and local level. Also, a capacity of uh, administration to uh, manage uh, participatory processes. Uh, um, and many, many other things. Uh, but I think that in the Czech Republic uh, we are on the mm -hmm. good track. Your Excellency, during your today's press conference, you have mentioned that it's important that the topic of participation is being uh, brought out of New York, that uh, the Czech Republic has an important role as, um, as a leader in Europe to bring this topic, to open this topic, and to talk on this very spot. How do you think that this topic resonates in the UN? The topic of participation. Yes, exactly. I, I think I think very well. I think now um, everyone is looking to find ways of doing it better mm -hmm. and opening up those spaces. We're, we're under a lot of um, uh, we've been under a lot of criticism for that. Come out of the UN. We've just finished two weeks of the Commission on the Status of Women. I've never seen so much participation as I have in this last two weeks, and it has also happened in the ECOSOC um, briefings that we've had. We're having more people that are not normally in there. And I can tell you that the President of the General Assembly is constantly on our case to do more to bring in civil society because that door is not wide open enough. Um, how, I do think you pressure, <coughs> excuse me, how do you pressure them when you are on them, you know, saying more and more? Mr. President, how he do you pressure them? He invites us to lunch and then we can't yeah. eat because <laughs> <laughs> he's making those demands. But I mean, I think that that's the right thing to do. I, I think that he's absolutely right. We have not opened those doors wide enough. And um, participation costs money. I don't think that this can be done in fresh air. So I think we do have to make the investment. Um, I think participation is more than just with civil society and young people, it's also with business. So we need to get participation, but not necessarily in silos. We need those multi-stakeholder <laughs> gatherings where we talk about how together we will find the solutions and implement the 2030 agenda. That's really what the 17 goals bring you together, you know, bring, bring for you. Um, and, and, and there are different ways of doing it. Technology should do it better for us. Uh, we find that even within us in the United Nations, um, in New York, our colleagues in Geneva feel that they are not included, the specialized agencies, the Human Rights Council. Um, and so we are better, it's not just traveling across the Atlantic, but use uh, technology so that you can go into their rooms um, and, and bring these issues up and hear the voices that are there. Um, again, I'll come back to language. Um, we have to learn to communicate, not just with them, um, as we would say, civil society and youth, those are the, the usual suspects that we're not doing so well with. But I know we're not doing well with business either. Um, and, and I think that that's another, another place where we need to reflect more and we appreciate um, some of the spaces that the PGA has opened up for um, uh, talking with business. And, and not just why, why you need to be in the 2030 agenda, but how can we action that 2030 agenda? This is what it has to be about. Slow start, lots of momentum. I think the good news is that it is not necessarily the UN that has kept the momentum going. Mm -hmm. It has been those who joined us on the journey <clears throat> in civil society and business that are doing that. Well, I'll share one observation with you when it comes to participation. Speaking about Czech Republic, Slovakia, this region, the, the overall level of participation is rather high. It's definitely above the global average. But at the same time, this participation uh, is limited to issues of local, national or regional importance. What I am missing is the global participation. We don't discuss global issues here, um, much less than uh, I've seen in many countries in Africa, for example. Somehow as if our, I'd say this, our world, yes, ends at the borders of the European Union. Mm -hmm. How do you change that? Let's talk about it. That's, that's what we are trying to do. Bring the visions or bring something that is absolutely precise that we can aim for a goal, such as, for example, the Americans had the goal to set food on the moon, something that was a shared vision among the whole generation and not only one generation of Americans. It's a, 
it's, it brings back the point that we've already addressed, the communication and mm -hmm. the linkage. So, uh, to an education, as a matter of fact, to understand that what's happening in New York at the United Nations, it's relevant for daily life of people in Prague or in Czech Republic or in Slovakia. And we, that, that link needs to be strengthened. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes it looks like the issues that UN is dealing with are too academic. Or uh, for the countries, the developed countries, uh, they don't think they are part of, of the UN business, which is not true. So we really have to bring the UN agenda, the global agenda, and the global responsibility to every member state. And we, we really have to be able to communicate why this is relevant for Slovakia, for Czech Republic, for other countries. Mm -hmm. And do you believe that it will be easier if we use concrete examples, such as, OK, on Tuesday, this is what happened in New York. Right now, on Friday, you can see the effects. Well, it... again, so sorry for again, stealing the floor, but migration is a big issue here. Mm -hmm. It's a big issue in my country. But we are, this, for us, migration is uh, only the end stage of migration. Mm -hmm. we, we quarrel about the redistribution. And we don't speak about what, I mean, what's for, what are the prompters or the triggers of migration and how to address the root causes of migration. So uh, th this is exactly the link to understand that it, migration is not about people knocking on our door, but migration is about what are the reasons forcing people moving out of their countries and how to address these reasons. So we deal with the consequences, not with the roots of the problem. Absolutely. And we, do, we refuse to see that the consequences are the consequences that, that begin with the roots. We also don't understand we're part of the problem. We have a universal agenda with universal challenges where everyone's got a collective responsibility, but they're also part of the problem. The communication we need is to show you how you can be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, where instead of the walls going up, we need to explain how um, we are better together. That um, with migration, have the uncomfortable conversation. Um, I, I think, you know, whether there is a right or a wrong, put it to one side and hear people. There are legitimate fears that we must address. And if we're not hearing them, how can we hope to address them? So there's, there's this sort of, let's not have that conversation, because you probably say things that are, uh, are not deemed to be the right thing to have been said, but it's what people feel. And if, unless you deal with that and you allow that voice to, to come out and to be spoken, even if you don't like what you're hearing, we will not begin to address the problem. Um, and I think that you know, many of these have been what we've done north-south. Now this is about a universal problem. As we've said, many of these know no borders. People are coming across the borders whether you like it or not. And if you don't understand it and you fear it, it's incumbent upon us as a community, as government, as a society to explain and to allay those fears um, so that we can address them and, 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 um, and move ahead. And, and I think that's not happening sufficiently. My greatest concern is if we don't do it with young people, then how will they find the solutions to deal with this? They will become much more um, look inward looking um, than, than we would hope them to. I don't think that this is, you know, because they're young and they've got more um, uh, access to technologies and wherewithal to do better and, and find the solutions. We have to have the conversation why they would want to use them. Um, I think we talk in the United Nations because we live it daily that we are a global village. We take it for granted. But I think as the PGA has just said, many people's world is in their borders. Mm -hmm. and, and more and more people are feeling safer within their borders. And, and, and that, I think, is, you know, not, that's an illusion. Is it? It's a very big illusion. I mean, this is, this is something that we have to, but I think we have to take the fear out of it. Um, I think where there is fear, then there is a problem. And, and I think that's what we have to deal with is... is Change is irrational into rational? Different narrative. I mean, this is what's exciting about the SDGs. I think the SDGs are also thought in some places to be rather elitist. It's coming from up on high, even though we did a good job to bring people into the conversation. Every, every country that I go to, people engage with us. But, you know, how does this become a reality in our countries? Mm -hmm. um, how do we help governments and their visions and their plans and their budgets to achieve um, the SDGs? They were part of shaping um, the SDGs. But, you know, I think now the support needs to be at the country level. The conversation needs to be there. We need to help people have that conversation locally so that they can attain the global aspirations. And with all this diversity we can see in the world, can then be one agenda that fits them all? If you put humanity at the center of it, yes, that's what it's about. It's, it's, it's peace, 
um, its prosperity, its tolerance, its respect, its dignity. That is one agenda, the core values for which the United Nations stands. Incredibly important that we all aspire to that. That's why the question you asked when we first came up, yep. what would we do without the, the SDGs? Uh, the question has been asked, what would we do without the United Nations? Would we be in a better or worse place? And I think that we all, at least I hope in this room, I certainly believe we would be in a much worse place. We need to have uh, that that brings us together, the core values that we need that should be the center of our world. The shared values worldwide. Mr. President, I fully agree that humanity is the one word, but I would add another word which is very important, multilateralism. That means to make sure we live in a world which is based on rules which are respected by everyone. We must not allow the erosion of multilateralism, which is exactly what's happening right now. So, and what's the alternative to multilateralism? The, the system when the rules are enforced by the big and powerful ones, is this what we want? So therefore, we need multilateralism. And this is, multilateralism is represented at its best by the United Nations. Do you but feel that we are right now on the edge? We are at the breaking point. We, uh, we see that. Uh, there is less uh, commitment to, the, to accepting the, the rules uh, for those who believe they can get away without uh, this respect. And for this we need to prove that multilateralism is the best answer, but it will not come by itself. That means we have to deliver, we have to be able to present results. We have to show that the international organizations that we've created are helping us to cope with the problems we are facing. I mean, one of, the, one, of the, one of the greater concerns is that do we have shared values today? As exactly. we've had. Worldwide, yes. not regional level. I, I think we worldwide. have not to take that for granted. And I think that the, the, the SDGs, the 2030 agenda, provides a basis for that to try to bring us back on that track uh, to have um, a set of shared values, um, a common place that where we all agree that, that this, is, this is our core. Um, and if, if that doesn't happen, then I think we, 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 do, um, we do task the, the fabric of our societies. Yeah, um, I would add also the cross-cutting nature of the 2030 Agenda. Mm -hmm. it, it, it means that we must see it uh, as, as a whole, not uh, each uh, SDG, uh, because, uh, for example, SDG 5, uh, it's about gender equality, but it is not... Uh, about the SDG 5 only, gender equality can help to eradicating uh, the extreme poverty, SDG 1 uh, it can help to, mm. to, to, to other things. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, we need uh, the reform of, of, of the United Nations and uh, it is uh, uh, the, the aim of uh, the UN Secretary General. We have now ongoing reforms because uh, the UN must deliver better, mm -hmm. definitely. I would like to ask you to mention three things that need to be changed concerning UN. You said we need a reform. What three changes do you see as crucial? Your Excellency, please open up. Uh, I, I can sign the, the reforms proposed by, by the UN Secretary General. It means the, the reform of peace and security, management reform, and uh, UN development system reform. Okay. Mr. President? Well, the theme of my presidency uh, of the General Assembly uh, sounds focusing on people. Uh, that means I feel as very important that in everything we do, we don't forget that it's about people, about people of this planet, about the ordinary men and women on the street who sh should feel that UN is here to help them. And uh, therefore, of course, this entails uh, communication, our ab the ability to, 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 to hear from people. <laughs> so this is very important, focusing on people. Second, to, to reform, to evolve, to adjust. Uh, we have several reform processes going on in the United Nations right now uh, because the world around us is changing and we have to be able to reflect upon these changes and, and to adjust and change the way we operate, again, to be, to, to be fit for purpose, as we call it in the UN speak. Mm -hmm. So I think these are the two, I, I, I might think of the third one, but the, these two came, came in instantly. <laughs> these two are crucial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I would say that the reforms that it is more of a transformation in the UN uh, so that we can live up to the aspirations of the 2030 agenda and help to deliver them. Um, and there are a number of things that have tasked us and whether it's we're better at communication or we're going to work at the global, global level, one of the reforms is about gender parity. Mm -hmm. So it's changing the dynamic, the power relations within an environment that allow you to achieve the zero tolerance for gender-based violence or sexual harassment um, or the fact that you will put in place equal uh, work for equal pay. Mm -hmm. So I think we need, as a, as, as a UN, if we want to be better at what we do um, and represent um, this global village, then that transformation has to happen. I think the second thing that needs to happen is that the, 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 the population that, um, uh, the one percent that holds 85 percent of our wealth needs to let go of some of it. Mm -hmm. I think if that doesn't happen, then we will be in a much worse crisis than we are. You cannot hold on to that, that kind of wealth and hope that the world will be well. Um, and the third thing I think is co constantly to say to everyone that um, what the Pope said a few years ago was a major challenge that the humanity was facing was the globalization of indifference. That you just turn the other way because it doesn't really matter to you. Um, I, think that, I think that is one of the biggest challenges we still have today, mm -hmm. is that we look inwards and rather than, than you know, see ourselves as part of that global village. That, that indifference is something that we have to put Perfect. in the dustbin. Are there any questions? Anything any one of you would like to ask to distinguished guests who are right now on the stage? Please. All right, uh, good morning. Uh, it's great uh, to be here in this uh, great country beautiful city and to listen to the excellent interventions by the uh, three speakers. I appreciate their uh, leadership and their respective roles. My name is Mahmoud Mohideen. I'm a senior vice president at the World Bank. just like to, um, to share a couple of points with this issue related to uh, knowledge and ignorance when it, um, when it matters for the sustainable development goals. I think we are all constrained by the evidence available to us. When we talk about SDG 1, Sustainable Development Goal 1, about ending poverty, we're all constrained globally by the fact that we don't really know what is happening after the year 2013. This is our maximum of knowledge today. If you are asking a specialist in poverty, they cannot really tell you anything beyond that figure of 2013. So we're locked in the MDGs era while we're talking about the SDGs. This doesn't deny the fact that we have information and knowledge in individual cases with advanced countries with their advanced information. But if we want to have a global perspective whether the SDGs are working or not, we are really constrained at this level. And I'm talking about one of the most basic indicators, which is poverty. The same goes for the rest of the indicators. So I think major investments are required not globally because you need really to get this data or from the local perspective and this requires more investments in data systems with national authorities. The other aspect, I think it's finance and I'm very happy with what I listened to including the partnerships with the private sector with the local community. But one of the main areas and Her Excellency the Ambassador mentioned the HLPF, we hope this year We'll be having more information about what's happening at national budgets and local budgets. So far, we have teams analyzing the HLPF submissions, the, uh, the visions for the future as submitted by countries. And there are very, very few countries which really did a good job in uh, outlining the budgets and the budget implications for the sustainable development goals, even for a couple of years to come. And without that, all the talk about partnerships with the private sector, identification of gaps, is going to be just a luxury. And uh, we look forward for that. The third is about implementation. I'm sitting next to His Excellency, the Minister of Planning of Colombia, and I think cases like Colombia, Kenya, Indonesia, are giving everybody a good lesson about how to localize the implementation, how to translate the SDGs into a kind of a day-to-day -day kind of function um, um, His Excellency, the President of General Assembly, mentioned global citizens with emphasis on the fact that all of us global citizens, but we are inhabitants of local communities and constrained again with what they do. One final word about, about technology. Um, the DSG mentioned technology 
in the positive way. And I think we take it that seriously. And we need really to have technology for better data, for better finance, financial inclusion, and better um, uh, uh, implementation. But recently, we have been seeing the disruptive actives of technology, which we can take it positively if we are able to adapt and harness the technology. But we have seen the man manipulative, destructive actives of technology without awareness and without regulations. And I think in the presence of leaders in the UN, I think we need really to have a dialogue because technology was mentioned in the FFD and the Addis agenda um, as one of the enablers. And I think it's very much about time to take that seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. Would you like to react? Yeah, uh, yeah you, you, you are completely right, and we have a significant uh, data gap. And uh, we must uh, really work, uh, work with that. And all the programs you, you, you mentioned, we will discuss the, in York in April, uh, a partnership forum and for, uh, forum for financing of development. And thank, uh, thank uh, to the World Bank that uh, you you willing really you are willing now to to participate in the final forum for financing of development and that we will have the dialogue with you too thank you very much for opening up because this is just the part of the long journey towards the let let's hope bright future of fulfilling the 2030 agenda the very last question the very last sentence two or three i would like to hear from you the crucial point the most important piece of information to everyone who is right now here in Chernin Palace or everyone who is right now watching us live on Facebook thanks to the live stream should remember the key, the most important information you would like to share. Mrs. Shatadeva, please. Uh, please uh, be engaged. Says Her Excellency Maria Shatadova, the ECOSOC President. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, please, the final word. The microphone is yours. Oh. Okay, she said it for us. No, no, I, no. no. I, I, th <laughs> I think it's very important that we engage with the 2030 agenda. We have to make it ours today and not tomorrow. Says Her Excellency Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> Mr. President. We are all part of one humanity and we all share one planet. And right now, with the way of life, we are, con uh, we are making this planet unlivable. And we should all be aware of our responsibility. That there are future generations to come and we, are, we have the responsibility to hand over this planet, if not in better shape, then definitely not in worse shape than it is today. Says His Excellency Miroslav Lajcak, President of the 72nd Session of the United Nations Assembly. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all for joining us in the panel. Thank you very much for the discussion. Thank you very much for the debate. We will have a 30-minute break, and we will continue with the debate about the examples of good practice at exactly 11.30. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>